Welcome to ProSide. Thank you for tuning in. We believe that life is best done in community, and we want to encourage you to be part of our weekly services and small groups. So don't do life alone. Let's do life together. Now, here's this week's message. So today, we're going to camp on two different passages of Scripture today, in Mark and in John. But we're going to start in the passage of John first. Let me give you the backdrop of what was happening. The disciples were on the journey going into the city, and as they were walking along the journey, Jesus encounters a woman, a Samaritan woman at the well. Most theologians say it was Jacob's well, and so Jesus was thirsty. So he asks this woman, may I have a drink from the well? And they have a short discussion of what worship is, what it is to worship God with your heart and soul, mind and strength, and in spirit and in truth. So they had the discussion. Well, the disciples were watching this encounter, and they were quite perplexed. They were quite wondering, what is Jesus doing talking to this woman? You have to realize that culturally, and it is the same today in the Middle East in many places, that a man, you're not able to just walk up to any random woman, especially in public, and have a conversation with her, because that would be a culturally unaccepted. And so here Jesus is breaking a culturally, cultural barrier and said, I'm going to have a conversation with a woman. And obviously the disciples were looking at this thing, what is, what is going on? The second thing about this woman is that she is a Samaritan woman or a half-breed Jew. And in that day, the Samaritan people were considered a lower class of people. And Jews and Samaritans didn't mingle together. And so here's the first strike, it's a woman. Jesus breaks that cultural background, gender background, a barrier, excuse me. And then he, it's a Samaritan woman, and he's having a conversation. And the third thing about this woman that we have to understand is that she is a woman of ill repute. Meaning this, she is known in her community, in her town, to be a woman that had, had many husbands. And the current man that she is with is not her husband. But Jesus did not hold that against her. What he did in that encounter, in that moment, was demonstrate love. He demonstrated grace. And he broke through the culture, the gender barriers that were separating the people of that day. And he says, I am not going to be held hostage to the sexism of that day, to the culture barriers of that day. And I'm going to cross over to have a conversation, to have a relationship of love and grace to this woman. Well, in that brief encounter, in that conversation, that woman is so excited. She sees something else about Jesus Christ. That here is a man full of wisdom, full of grace, full of love. And in that chance encounter, she is now interested. What is this? What is this about this man? And so she's so excited. She runs back to her town and starts to spread the word about this encounter she just had with Jesus. And the people are now looking at this woman going, whoa, okay, this woman has an ill repute. It does not have a, does not have a good reputation in our, our, our town, our city. But we see something different about her, that in this encounter with Jesus, she has now been transformed because of his love, because of his grace. And as the people see the transformation pretty much instantly, there now, their, in, their interest is piqued. And now they're saying, well, we're going to go check out this man called Jesus. And so she gathers the entire town or most of the townspeople, and they follow her out of town to Jacob's well to meet Jesus. And this is where we pick up the story with the disciples. So the townspeople are now coming toward them. But the disciples have a different agenda. We pick it up here. In verse 31 of the Gospel of John, now John is the fourth book in the New Testament. For those of you who are here for the very first time or been coming for the last several weeks, the Bible is comprised of two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And John is located as the fourth book in the New Testament. So we pick it up here in verse 31. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, this is what was on their mind presently, Rabbi, teacher, master, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? Interesting, the disciples. 
They're with Jesus, and all of a sudden, they're thinking about themselves. And now they're blaming each other. Why didn't you bring food? Peter, you're the ringleader. Shouldn't you have thought about the rest of us and brought food? The master needs to eat something. He's hungry. All right? And I, I, can, I, can, I can see Peter going firing right back at the rest of the disciples. Well, what about Judas? He has the money. Okay, that was a joke. Okay. <laughs> Bad joke. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it is still four months unto harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, I ask that your spirit would illuminate your word this morning. I pray that you continue to draw us closer to you. I pray that there would be a joy and grace and love deposited into every heart here this morning. Bless us here with your presence. And Lord, bless each one's football team this morning because they are here. We are all winners. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are here this morning, your football team will win. Okay, the person next to you might have a different team, but you're all winners in Jesus' eyes. Let me start here. Our faith is fueled, is fueled, it's sustained, and it increases when we obey God our Father, the will of God our Father. Our God is loving. He's not in heaven with a big baseball bat ready to bang us every moment we sin or fall short. We all fall short of the glory of God. But He is a loving God, a God that wants to see the purposes in your life fulfilled for you to bear fruit, for you to accomplish the mission that He has called each and every one of us. But Jesus is saying, my food is to do the will of my Father. And do not say four months more. Let, let's open this passage and encounter with the disciples. Now, you know, the townspeople are coming, but Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples in the moment. The disciples were hungry, just like many of you. How many of you had breakfast this morning? Okay, I had oatmeal this morning. Some of you had Portuguese sausage, eggs, rice, all the stuff I want to eat. I had oatmeal, all right. Bland, nasty oatmeal. But I heard it's good for me, so I just powered through it. <laughs> Nastiness. Okay. So some of you guys are hungry now, all right? You're thinking about lunch now, brunch. Well, the disciples were hungry. They were facing the reality of being hungry. And of course, I like the disciples, right? They make it like they had good intentions. Teacher, you know, do you, are you hungry? Do you need food? No, if you peel the layers back, they were actually saying, Lord, don't you see that we're hangry? We're hungry. We're starving. We've been walking on this dusty road following you. You stopped to have this conversation. Couldn't you have this conversation later? We want to get to town, get to that restaurant, get to Zippy's where all roads lead to. <laughs> and they had an intention. They had, they, they had a mindset. Lord, we're hungry. They looked at themselves and said, we're starving. I love what Jesus says. Jesus used an analogy of the harvest season or harvest cycle. If you're a farmer here, you might realize this, and, and I hope this is true. But when you plant a seed, usually it takes about four months. In, because the Jewish culture, they were agricultural society. So he used a harvest and planting analogy to grab the disciples' attention. So he said, in four months, you would reap and harvest. But do not wait for four months because the harvest is now. It doesn't, you don't need to wait for four months to see the initial fruit of sowing a seed. The, it, it, the harvest is ripe right now. And he said this, reason why he said, look up, raise your eyes off of yourself, off of your need, off of your lack of in your life. How many times have we looked down on our life? Right? And we had those conversations, those prayer moments, complaining prayers as I call it. I, had those, I have those too sometimes. It's not a prayer. It's a complaining prayer. Lord, I don't have her yet. Lord, I don't have him yet. Lord, I don't have this blessing. I don't have that promotion. I don't have my healing. I don't have this. It's, I don't have this. I have nothing. Like that Whitney song. All right. Sorry. 
the car note there. All right, I have nothing. Lord, disciples are saying, Lord, we have nothing. Look at us. We're hungry. We're starving. And Jesus is saying, no, my food is to do the will of my Father, that your faith will be fueled and it will be sustained. Your life will be sustained. And then your faith will increase and be blessed when you obey the Lord. Faith and obedience go hand in hand. They co-labor together. They co-work together. You can't have one without the other. Okay, all the old people remember that jingle. The young people are like, what are you singing? All right? Google it. <laughs> Faith and obedience work hand in hand together. You got to have one with the other. Both and working together. Faith and obedience. And Jesus is saying this. Reason why he told his disciples, look up. Because the harvest is near. And who was the harvest? Who was coming? She'll be coming around the mountain. I don't know why I'm singing so much this morning. It's the great worship this morning. Got me all excited. The harvest was coming. And that harvest that Jesus wanted the disciples to look up. This wasn't a, a figurative speech. This was a literal speech to the disciples. Look up. Gaze ahead of you. Because look who's coming down that path toward us. The Samaritan woman and all of the townspeople are coming. That's the harvest field right in front of you. If only you would look away from your lack of the things that are pressing you in and look up. And God says, look up to all of us. Yes, all of us have needs. How many have needs? We all have needs. We have different circumstances in our life that are working against us. But if we would take our eyes off of ourselves, off of our need, off of our lack of in our life, and start to look up at the people around us, you already had the hope of the world in your life. And if you would take the gospel, and if you would take his love to people around us, you will be blessed. Your faith will be fueled. Your faith will be sustained, and your faith will increase. Faith pleases the heart of God. But obedience moves the hand of God. Let me say it again. Faith pleases the, hand, the heart of God, but obedience in your life moves the hand of God. Are you walking in obedience? Are you obeying the will of the Father? Are you walking in the purposes that He has for you? Because if you do, you will be, your faith will increase. Can I hear amen? amen. You know, one of my things in my life, and some of you know, I am, I'm on a journey to be more healthy, to lose weight, to, to, to trim off some of the fat, as it were. And, and now I've been doing it for quite some time, and I've lost nearly 40 pounds in, in the journey of getting better. But early on in the journey, it was difficult because I didn't want to go to the gym. I didn't want to eat healthy. I wanted to eat my chicken katsu curry, baby. Last night, I had a cheat meal. I must, I must, I must repent. I didn't tell my wife. She's watching online, on screen, in the break room there, you know, because she had a missions meeting. I'm conf confessing before you, because I'm honest. You know, yesterday, I, I, we had some of our volunteers, our ops team, I said, let's go, let's go have some Japanese food. So, you know, I was trying to be healthy. I said, I'm just going to have a cheat meal. And so I had a little mini mochiko chicken curry with four pieces of gyoza. Mini, small. Okay, it was small, okay? It wasn't... A few calories, okay? All right. It's like, okay, I have a cheap meal. The body, right? I heard people say, shock your body, right? So I'm shocking my body. <laughs> but after, after, I, 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 I kind of, I must, I must confess, uh, uh, I had another cheap meal after that. <laughs> I left the guys, and then I had one of my other friends with me. He was riding the car with me. I said, you know, my wife's in this meeting, so I, I, got, I got some time to kill. I got time to kill. I got to hang out in the area till she gets back. So I said, yeah, let's go have some dessert at Zippy's. <laughs> I just wanted a tiny dessert, just a tiny dessert. But I, I, I flunked the test because when I saw the menu, my eyes focused on one thing, chili and rice. Chili and rice <laughs> is calling out my name. And so I had a bowl of chili and rice, and it was so good. <laughs> Double shocked my body. Both paddles, baby. <laughs> and I had the chili and rice. And on top of that, I had dessert. 
That's why I'm so excited this morning. I got some protein in my body. Woo, baby. I don't know where that's all coming from. What I realized is, okay, let me get back to the, the, what I was saying. Early on in my journey, it, it, I had to, in order to get the muscles to look like my body, like I had muscles underneath my layers of fat, I had to diet and exercise and work hard and diligently in order to trim the excess fat in my life. And I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm almost there, about 10 more pounds to my goal. But I realized this, and my trainer said this, this is the moment. You lost a lot of weight. But the last few pounds, guess what? It's going to be the hardest for you to, to lose. So this is what we have to do. We're going to have to change your diet. I said, change my diet? I think my diet's okay. No, we're going to have to change your diet again. And every two weeks, we're going to change your diet because if you don't change your diet, your body will get used to it, and it's going to plateau, and it's going to be very hard to lose the weight. No matter how much cardio you do, baby, you're, going to lose, you're not going to lose the weight. So I said, every two weeks. I bring that to a spiritual analogy. In our life, do we change the diet? What kind of diet are we on spiritually? Is it a Facebook diet or is it his book's diet? Are we just reading the verse of the day or are we changing our diet to say, you know what, instead of the verse of the day, let me expand my diet spiritually and try to get a whole chapter of the day in. Instead of a drive-by prayer yelling at people in traffic, how about I spend time worshiping the Lord and praying? Can I hear amen? Are you getting me? Are you feeling me? Maybe it's time to change your diet to get the Word of God in you, to get more time in prayer, to come on time to worship, be in grace group. I'm going to spell this correctly today. I spelled it wrong in the first service, W-E-E-K-L-Y. I always say W-E-E-K-L-E for some reason. I don't know why. Weekly, get in your grace group. Get in relationship with one another. Come on. Come on. Can I hear amen? Our faith increases when we are intentional. Everybody say Intentional. When we are intentional about bringing people to Jesus. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. We're going to camp in this scripture, the rest of the message. In Mark chapter 2, verse 1, it says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. So you see the picture. Jesus is now entering Capernaum, the city. Word is getting out, and people want to encounter and, and hear from Jesus. So there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Verse 3, some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, everybody say faith faith. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Skip forward to verse 10. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like that. Jesus, who was kind of, kind of cast out of his own city of Nazareth, rejected, now made Capernaum his new home his new base of operations, as it were, in that day. And theologians have said this could have been Jesus' Jesus's new home, um, but most theologians believe it was actually the apostle, uh, disciple Simon Peter's home. And so word gets out. People are coming. They're hungry. They want to be healed. They want to learn from the master. So they flood the place so there was no room in the inn. There was no room. Standing room only, all the way out the door. But there was four men, a band of brothers, I call them the grace group. Everybody say grace group. A band of brothers that looked around and remembered that they had a friend who was paralyzed. A friend who was paralyzed from birth, who could not walk. And they, re they heard about Jesus being at the home. And they realized that this was the man that could heal their friend. So they, can, they concocted a plan and said, let's come together. Let's put together a mat. Maybe it was the man's mat. And they said, let's pick him up and deliver him and bring him to Jesus. And I can imagine the paralyzed man going, no, what are you doing? I can't move. I've been here all my life. It hurts. But the guy said, no, we're going to pick you up and we're going to bring you to Jesus. They get to the house. No room. 
The people inside of the house, yes, they had good intentions. They had disciples in there. They had people that wanted to learn. They had people looking for healing. But in the mix, there was also teachers of the law, scribes and Pharisees in there to trip up Jesus, to find something that he was saying to use against him. And because of the crowd of people, the people there did not realize that there was a man outside that needed healing. But they forgot. And they didn't make room in that house they didn't make way to allow that man to come closer to Jesus. So the four friends, the grace group said, guess what we're going to do? We're going we're gonna to walk around the house. Whoa, there's some stairs on the side. Let's go up the stairs. Let's bring our friend up to the, to the, to the, top, of the top of the roof and see how we can deliver him to Jesus. They were on a mission. They were intentional. They weren't just hanging out. They weren't taking the man to a basketball game. They weren't taking their friend to a barbecue at Ala Moana Beach Park. No, they wanted to take their friend to Jesus, and they were very intentional about it. And nothing was going to stop them from getting their friend to Jesus because their friend needed healing. He was paralyzed in our life. Do we have that same intentionality in our life? Do we have that same fervor of people in our life? Because in our life, if we would look up at the harvest around us, we will see people paralyzed in their emotions. We would see people paralyzed in their perspective. We would see people paralyzed in their relationships. We would see people paralyzed in the need of their life. But are we looking up at the harvest around us in our neighborhoods, in our families, in the campus, in the marketplaces, and bringing them to Jesus? Or are we like the disciples looking down? Lord, I'm hungry. I have nothing. I have nothing. And Jesus this morning, as we conclude this series, is saying, church, look up. Because the harvest field is ripe. And it's right in your backyard. And they're right around you. Will you bring them to me so I can touch them? I can love them. I can put my grace and my presence upon them. Can I hear amen? Our faith increases when we are unified in our mission. These four men were unified on mission. Can you imagine this? Now, you know me. I'm very vivid in my imagination when I read the Bible because it is alive. It's breathing. It, it's, it's powerful. And so as I read this scripture of the four men, can you imagine the conversations with them? Guys, come on. We can do this. No, there's no room. We can't get around this crowd. We can't get in. No, there's stairs. We can do it. No, it's too hard. It's, it's harder than going up Cocoa Head. Come on, it's too hard. It's too diff- He's heavy. He stink. Woo! He hasn't bathed in years, and we're going to take him to Jesus? No, we can do this. I was going to actually try and do this, but I, because of safety, I decided not to. I was going to get a mat and four guys and try to carry somebody. I said, I better not. Because people, somebody might get hurt. <laughs> but you have to see this. Up the stairs, four men in unison step. I, gotta, I can do this. Sorry, cameraman. Just pretend it's four of me. Sometimes multiple personalities. Okay. Wow. Up the stairs. Up the stairs. Up the stairs all the way to the top. Karen, they had to walk in step. They had to walk in unity. They had to walk together. Because if one person slipped, if one person took a wrong step, all of them would have crashed on the bottom. But they walked together in unity. Can you imagine that? Come on, let's do this. We have a friend that's in need. Let's take him to Jesus. Let's do this together. Everybody say, together. Bible says in Psalms 133 verse 1, I says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. Everybody say unity. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing. My submission to you this morning, maybe the blessing of God has not yet come into your life, into your home, into your business, into your, into your campus, because there might be disunity in the camp. These four men, they were unified. They were walking step by step by step, by step, until they got to the top. And they said then they had to dig through the roof. They had to get down on their hands and knees and together make a way so that they could lower their friend to Jesus. Unity. Paul writes this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. All of us are called to which you've been called with humility, 
with gentleness, with patience, woo, the big word there, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity in the spirit and the bond of peace. Are we eager? Are we excited to have peace? Or are we looking at ourselves? Are we looking at our, 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 our situations in life? Are we criticizing other believers? Are we looking at their Facebook page and going, oh, what's that? Let me comment about that. And another person goes, oh, you commented. Let me comment back. And then pretty soon there's a war on comments on, on social media. Stop it. I told my wife, one day we're going to fast social media. That might be a challenge, baby. Woo. But sometimes we look at things, and it just brings division. Look at our country. And let's talk about our country. We're facing more racial divide. It's coming up in different pockets in society. All right? We're facing more cultural divides. We're, we're facing more family divides and, and brokenness and disunity. I mean, I, I look at our own state. I mean, I look at a president. If I was the PR director of, of our president, I would say, sir, I serve at your pleasure, but can I unplug your Twitter account? <laughs> I would. I would hack his Twitter account and shut it off. You know, but there's so much divide, division in, in our country. And the Holy Spirit and God is hovering in our nation, hovering in our state. And guess who's the first person that the Holy Spirit is looking at? He's looking at us, the church. Can we be unified in love? Can we be unified in mission? Can we be unified in serving one Lord? Or, or is it all about ourselves? Come on, pastor, you're preaching now. The greatest challenge to the church, to us as individuals, is a challenge for unity. It's to fight for unity. Not fighting, with, not fighting against each other, but fighting with each other against the enemy. Our mission is to depopulate hell and populate heaven. Can I hear amen? amen? And nothing else in this world matters except that. Can we as a church be unified? Can we as a church come together and say, let's get back on mission where we, we have walked in this life thinking about ourselves, our lack of, our hungriness in different areas of our life and say, Lord, let me look up at the harvest field. People who don't know you People who don't have, haven't had a deposit of your love in their life, can I be a conduit, Lord, to them? Can I be a link of your love to them and draw them to you? Can I hear amen? amen? Unity brings the blessings of God. If you want the blessing of God in your life, bring the unity. Be unified in your heart. Be unified in your mission. Be unified in the purpose that God has called you. And we together as a church... Once the church comes together in unity, trust me, the Lord is going to bless. He's going to bring his presence. He's going to bring that healing that you've been wanting. He's going to bring that provision that you've been calling out to him for. If you would walk in unity. Can I hear a strong amen? amen. Our faith increases as we respond, as we see Jesus respond to our prayer, to our plea. Verse 12 says, he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full, full view of them all. Everybody saw this healing. Everybody saw Jesus forgive this man of his sins. This amazed, this amazed everyone. Disciples, people there that came for healing. The scribes and the Pharisees that were there to, to set up traps for Jesus, to find holes in his message in order to accuse him of blasphemy. All of these people looked and saw the miracle that was provided to this paralyzed man. And they were amazed and they gave praise to God. When people are blessed around you, are you blessed to see them blessed? Or are you critical and judgmental? And then you start to look at yourself, God, what about me? I've been praying. Why haven't you responded to my prayers? Look at them. Look at how they're living and how can you bless them? Right? When people are blessed, we are all blessed. When people get healed, guess what? You, you're, you're healed too as well. You receive the same blessing. But we start to look at, well, they got blessed. Well, what about me? They're, I'm hungry again, Lord. Watch this. Look up. Look up. 
Keep your focus on me. Keep your gaze up. Because as you're on mission, I will bless. As you're unified, I will bless. Because he loves us. He wants to respond to you. He really does. We've been talking about faith and walking in faith. Keep on believing. Keep on trusting that provision, that healing, that reconciliation, that thing in your life, that meaning in your life will be touched as you walk together in unity. And finally, before we bring our guest testimony up, our faith increases when our priorities remain consistent with God's priorities. When it lines up, when our priorities line up with God's priorities, not my will, but Lord, your will be done. Jesus said, my food, he would be fed spiritually. He would be fed internally as he obeyed God the Father. In your life, you will be fed spiritually. You will be provided for. You will be blessed as you obey the Lord, as you allow your priorities to line up with his priorities which is people, which is seeking and saving the lost, right? Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man, which is Jesus Christ, came to seek and to save the lost. Majority of us in this room, we were in that position once. And sometimes we can forget. I've now been serving Christ for 40 years. Well, 38, I had two years of slippage. <laughs> so I'll chalk off 38 years, to be honest. All right. But I tell you what, sometimes the longer we, we get away from the moment of coming to Christ, we forget that love when we first encountered Christ. We forget how God touched us, how God healed us. We forget our first love. And I tell you what, and we forget the why we are on this earth. And pretty soon, the, the farther we get away from the moment of committing our life to Christ, the farther we get, sometimes our face drops and starts to look at ourselves, our own life. This morning, my mission, my mission is that all of us would look up, look up at the harvest field, look at the people who are paralyzed in their life and bring them to Jesus. Let our life priorities align together with God's priorities. The last words of Jesus out of Matthew 28 says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So therefore, each and every one of us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I will wi be with you to the very end of the age. His promises for His presence to be with you as you go and make disciples, as you stay on mission. I didn't read this earlier in the first service, but let me read this. This is from Pastor Jim Zimbala who's the pastor of, of the great Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York City. Great church. We sing some of the songs they have written, and a lot of the songs are spread all over the world, gospel songs. But Pastor Jim writes this in his book, Storm, and he shares about how he sees the fire of God going out in the life of the church in America. And I quote, We are not as big as we think. A quick Google search will reveal some surprising statistics about Christians in America. For example, one website says that there are 246,780,000, 280,000 people that are Christians. 79.5% of the population of the United States are Christians. That's a huge percentage of Christians who claim to be followers of Christ. But is it true or is it a bogus number? If nearly 80% of the population were Christian, wouldn't we see the effects of that in our culture? Let me ask the question in a different way. Are 8 out of 10 people in your school, in your office, in your family, in your community, are they Bible-believing, church-going followers of Jesus? And the answer, truthfully, would be no. He also states, that in order to get an accurate count of Bible-believing Christians in America, they, they did four different studies by four different researchers who had four different motivations using four different methodologies in order to calculate and, and decide that real number. Their unanimous conclusion was that the actual number of evangelical Christians, Bible-believing, church-going, faith-filled Christians is shockingly between 7 to 8.9%. Of the U.S. population. Whoo! The veil has been removed. 
That's right, only 7 to 8.9% of America. Not 40% and certainly not 70%. The truth is that the number of real believers in Jesus is on a massive decline, and that decline is happening much more rapidly than we have thought. Look at our state. How much division do we have in different multiples of government, different places of society? This past Friday, I had an opportunity to have a meeting uh, with a lawyer, an attorney. And I had an agenda in this meeting. I called for the meeting, and I said, uh, can we meet? And so I had a particular agenda as I was starting this conversation. And in the middle of the conversation, he said, you know what? Can, can I really share what my real job responsibility is? I said, sure. He says, my number one responsibility in this law firm, very successful law firm, if I said the firm, many of you would know. Beautiful, we're in this beautiful conference room, bigger than my house, overlooking the harbor, beautiful picture when it's huge, 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 huge. We could all fit in the conference room. And so I, as I looked over the, the harbor, he said, you know what my responsibility is? My number one responsibility is I'm the lead lawyer representing Hart, the rail. I know some of you started twitching. Okay. <laughs> Relax. And as I, as, I, as I shared the story, he said, you know what? These last four to five years have been the most difficult years of my life. It's been challenging. And he actually showed me, we looked down on the street, we're high above in the, in the tower, and he showed me the direction of the rail, and he'd go to here, Halakuila, up Queen, all the way up to Alamoana and different things. And, and he said, you know, I've never seen the, the, really the, 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 the humanity at its worst when it comes to money. My, 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 my job's been on the line. I've been threatened. It, it's been tough for my family. And as I stood there, now the light went on. Bing! This is the true agenda for this meeting. Paris, you came with your own agenda. But the Holy Spirit dropped in and said, no, let me change your agenda to my agenda. I want you to look up. Get off the street, look up at this man. And I felt the Holy Spirit said, the reason why you're here in this meeting, one-to-one, nobody else in this big conference room, is to pray for this man, to love on him, to encourage him. And whether I agree or not, that doesn't matter. It's just for me to support him as a Christian, as a disciple. And so what ended up being, what, what I thought was an agenda-driven meeting, turned out into a prayer meeting. And in the moment, but if I was just wrapped up with my own agenda, I got time, you're going to be charging me a large amount, so I'm going to make this quick, 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 quick. Let's go, let's go. Talk faster. <laughs> Let me get out of here. I got to pay a lot of parking. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> if it was about that, I would have missed an opportunity to pray for this man, to love him with the love of Christ, to see him come to a place of, wow, God's presence dropped in. God's presence dropped in. Yesterday morning, along with Pastor Kathy, Pastor Billy Pacarl, I had the honor and, 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 and um, privilege to officiate the burial for Mark Ma. I don't know if many of you know his story. He's a young man, stellar athlete at Iolani School, went on to play, play for the Nevada Wolfpack football team, lost his life when his friends were caught in the tide and they were in trouble in their boat, in their little craft, and he jumped out of the boat and swam for help. And our, 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 the, he lost his life. And so when I was there doing the, doing the burial, what I thought was my agenda to make it short, I didn't expect a lot of people there. Some of the family might be here this morning. And I had my own agenda to just kind of go through the motions and just do it. Because I'll be honest, sometimes when we do these things, I don't feel the presence of God. I really don't. But this was different. The amount of people that showed up, right, Pastor Kathy? I was blown away. I thought maybe the family members, a few friends, there were nearly 100 people that showed up at the grave site. And, and, and I tell you what, God's presence dropped in. It went from my agenda, my deal, to just officiate a burial ceremony. It went, and God reorchestrated everything. There's another woman that, that helped me do the eulogy, and she just presented the gospel preached scripture, preached about Mark's life, about the mission of God that while on this earth at, at a young age, he was on a mission for Christ. 
and God's presence just dropped in. It was amazing. They were at a place of pain and loss, but in the moment, they felt the love of Christ. And, and it was a wake-up call for me as a pastor, as a minister, to say, it's not your agenda, but it's my agenda. In our life, do we look at our life and, and is it all about us, our agenda, or is it about God's agenda? This morning, we have the privilege to hear from one of our small group leaders. Um, can we welcome Vanessa Christner to the stage? Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. All right, thank you. You can have a seat. Let me, uh, you're a small group leader. You've been in that church for a couple of years now, but let me just kind of give the people a, a background of who you were, of who you are, or who you were, excuse me. Um, you were raised as a Catholic, a faithful Catholic, did all the rituals, all the routines as, as a Catholic. Um, you even got married in a Catholic church. Your husband, is your husband here this morning? He's not here yet? Next service? Okay. <laughs> he was here last night. Um, you got married in the Catholic church, um, and, and you're just kind of just following the routine as a good Catholic. Um, then your husband got invited by a friend to attend um, First Assembly of God on Red Hill, and for the first time he encountered God's love and God's presence in a real tangible way, committed his life to Christ, got saved, and then he invited you, and you, you encountered God's love and his grace in your life, and you, you moved from, like you said, as when we met, you moved from religion to a relationship, and life dramatically changed. And so life was moving forward. And got busy at work, and, and then your daughter, Sabina, yeah, got involved with our college ministry and the young people, and, and, and it's excited and doing some great things, and uh, she invited you to our, our, one of our services on Easter 2015, and you became a part of our church, and so things were moving forward. You became a grace group leader, got into a grace group, did all the things that were asked, and you were excited about it, but then a storm came in your life that, that God kind of use and redirected you. Share us about that. Yeah, so that was the, uh, the biggest storm of my life. So I uh, was leading a really stressful life, uh, busy with work, busy with home life, and then also teaching my Zumba classes. Zumba is exercise in disguise, which is dance fitness. Well, can I just pause? How many people like Zumba or do Zumba? Yeah, be proud. Of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right. Zumba eats in the crowd. All right. Yeah, so I was uh, very stressful doing all of that. Well, back in um, uh, August 2016, I was teaching um, as a guest instructor, and I, uh, when I was on stage, I felt my legs get numb, and my body started to shut down, and so I, was, I knew something was wrong, but I knew I had to get through teaching, so I got through it, uh, got off stage, and I couldn't breathe. I, I was gasping for air, and it was very chaotic, and the, the, they called the 911. Um, they came and took me away. And in the ambulance was, uh, with me was Maria. And Maria was one of my students the previous year that uh, I led to Christ. And she was in the ambulance praying for me. So we got to uh, Polymomi, and the results showed that I had a, a heart attack and that my vessel was blocked, and they uh, did surgery on me and inserted a stent to open up the vessel so that I could breathe normally. And so I was there for about uh, five days uh, in the hospital, recovering and going through the biggest storm of my life. And so you were there. Um, I can imagine what anybody would be thinking when they go through a storm like that, probably thinking that this is it. You know, I'll never see my family again. Uh, my life is done. Um, what was going on? What was going on in your heart, in your mind while you were lying there? Well, when I was in there, first of all, I was in disbelief. Like, I couldn't believe that what the doctors was telling me is what I had. But I was also scared, uh, and I was mad, because I was asking God, why is he taking away all the things that I love, and I'm going through this? But he also showed me that I need to rely on him, that through, through that time, I was still giving God glory. And I, I believed that I was going to be healed, I was going to be restored, and I... And I said, I, you know, I, I still need to teach. So when I was trying to walk from the bed to the bathroom, I was just doing my little moves, and I got scolding <laughs> from my family, and they said, stop it, your heart rate's going up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I knew that God was uh, doing the work, and uh, I was also thinking in my mind, gosh, what if I teach again and it, and it happens again? So I had to, again, rely on God, and he said, don't be fearful. 
I'm doing a great work in your life, and mm. I will heal, and I will restore you. So through, through that piece, I was able to, to get through it. Yeah, so you were there in the hospital for five days, and Jesus was in the grave for three days. <laughs> so you had a little extended stay. Um, but the word was getting out. Um, Sabina started texting everybody. The word got to our staff. Our, our, our staff started praying, and the word got to your grace group. We have a picture of your grace group up here. And they, they started praying, and pretty soon it started to go viral. And, and then pretty soon hundreds of people were praying for you, and, it, and God healed you, and God healed you. What was God saying to you in, in while you were on your back, uh, in the moments of uncertainty, believing for your healing? People are praying. What was God speaking to you? One of the first things that God spoke to me while I had a lot of rest time was that I needed to let go of some of the things that was in my heart that was not of him. And that's why he gave me that time to rest in the hospital. And then he also said, I'm giving you this time to reprioritize your life. I need you to refocus on me because you're too busy. You're too busy doing everything. And um, that he was going to do great things, that he had a great vision of what he wanted me to do. And I was, I was excited, and, and I knew I would get through it, but I had to trust him. And I had to trust what he was telling me. And prayer, constant prayer is what um, helped me through it. And, and my family and my grace group, especially by my side. And so you faced the storm head on. Uh, God healed you. You overcame. Then, but then God spoke to you to, to be back on mission. And coming out of the hospital on days after, um, you went back and started teaching. And, but this is a, now a different priority, a different looking up at the people group that God assigned to you. And now you came out firing in, in a different way. Tell us about that. Yeah, so when I got out and I, I healed and everything, so I decided to go through a heart rehab and I lost 40 pounds, and I stopped eating anything with two eyes, which means I'm a vegetarian. But anyway, so <laughs> I uh, went, on, went through that, and what God said was to use the Zumba classes that I teach yeah. as a ministry, that I was to use this ministry to reach out to people who are lost, who are in the dark, and, and to bring them to Christ, and also to use my grace group and, and get them to be instructors so that they can take what I was doing and, and multiply it uh, further so that we can reach more people. And then even beyond that, he's shown me that it will go beyond Hawaii, that one of my instructors who's leaving is going to take it uh, to the mainland. So it was really exciting. And, and the other thing that he said to do was, I, I need you to reach out at your workplace. I work for the Army where we service soldiers every day, and they're going through a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. So God put me in an uncomfortable job for a reason. So these are all the things that God had me do, and I'm being obedient and trusting him for what he has it, it, It's amazing the platform that God has placed you on. Um, I, I work on that 24-hour fitness. I know you can't tell, um, but the 6 o'clock, there's, there's several nights a week where the Zubaites take over the basketball court at 24-hour fitness, and you used to see the basketball players, all right? They come out angry, like, oh, who are these people taking over our court? And they, they, they hurry back as soon as the class is over. But I realized this when I was on my elliptical, when you can spend time with the Lord. <laughs> Nothing else to do. I looked through the glass because I, I like to position myself just to be able to see everything. And, and then I noticed this, that people who are coming to that class come with different needs. Some with health challenges, of course. Some with burdens in their relationship. Some with these things going on in their life, and they're coming to this class for relief, just to get away, just to get away from the, the, the chaos and, and the, and, uh, of the world that they're facing. And I realize that, that if there's a purpose to what you do, you open up your class, your instructors open up your class with prayer. You set the plate for God's presence to drop in. As people are dancing, God is touching their life. There's conversations happening after the class. I mean, look, we have some of the Zumba instructors here, or, or you're here kind of all over the place. Would you, would you, for part of this group, would you please stand really quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, come on. Yeah, stand. Look at that. They're all dressed. You can't miss them. <laughs> Let me tell you about these ladies. All of these ladies, their family, they're all new to Christ less than a year and a half. And it came from Vanessa, out of your womb, out of your faithfulness to the Lord. Um, parting shot, what would you say to us? Maybe some people are here they're struggling, maybe they, they, their priorities. Maybe they, they feel like they're the paralyzed. 
man on, on the mat. And they need to come to Jesus. What would you say to encourage us this morning? Well, I would encourage everyone, when God puts in your heart, to reach out to the one, to be obedient and reach out. But I'm encouraged by the scripture from Romans 12, 12. Uh, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. So I encourage all of us that even though we're going through storms, even though there may be uh, rejections or hard times, that God is going to use that for us to fulfill the vision that he has for our lives. So, you know, use the talent and the gifts that he's given you and follow what he's telling you because so many lives will be impacted for his kingdom. And, and that's what we're here to do. That's what our purpose is. Yeah, the, of all the people that you've been reached, we often say the greatest number is one. And there's one specific person that God orchestrated in, in kind of put your relationship together. Share us about who that is. And, yeah, so one of my students, uh, her name is Rosalie Ascension Star. She uh, came into class and, um, you know, God spoke to me to reach out to her. So I reached out to her. We went out a couple of times and found out we have a lot in common. And through those meetings, we developed a close relationship, really a quick connection. So I invited her to a church, she and her husband, Kevin, and they came to Grace Bible, and through that, they were um, saved. And I knew that when that happened, that was all God, because God's going to show you which one to reach out to. The Holy Spirit's going to show you who that person is. And Rosalie is the one that will take this further. She'll, she will multiply this. So she's on fire, too, and, and the rest of my Grace group. So, yeah. I always ask God when the students come in, which one? Which yeah. one, Lord? Because you always are looking up at the harvest. Amen. Can we give it up here for Vanessa Christmas? Thank you so much. Thank you. Powerful. Yeah. Hi, welcome to Grace in Action. I'm Naomi, and I am here on a beautiful Thursday night at the University of Hawaii Manoa campus. As you know, we've had a fabulous I Heart Grace Group month, being inspired by your stories. more stories of lives being changed and impacted by grace groups. Um, the way I found out was I got really, really sick and they did an ultrasound and a CAT scan and they found only one kidney. Um, but it was through my grace group that I was able to just overcome it and really learn that God is bigger than our problems. And everything just started to fall into place and I really um, thank God for the ladies that I was able to, to do that with. And because of that I've got a chance to branch off and I get to kind of lead some of my own girls on the Kaneohe side. So it's been just a great experience. Because of the, the power of prayer uh, and, and, a, and my grace group, um, you know, I, I was able to overcome uh, the, the addiction. I know that God took the taste of alcohol from my life, like forever, like to the point where I, I know that I will never have to, to drink another drop of alcohol again in my life. I will walk into eternity not, not having to, to drink another drop. It's, born, it's this October will be 14 years. It's exciting. Actually, we just had a, we just, um, had a seeker, and now she's a, be a believer, and we're starting to, you know, get her into the one-to-one, -one, and it's exciting to see somebody so on fire and passionate. It creates a new drive for you and a new fire within the group, and it, you know, makes you just have a fresh fire for Christ. All it took was somebody to invite me to Grace Group one day, and that's where I found Jesus Christ, or He found me, and my life's never been the same since. Uh, it's touched my life. It's touched all the people around me, and. As a result, we see all kinds of stuff happening. You know, there, there are other grace groups, there are other people coming with me to church and finding the Lord, and uh, it's super exciting. There's, a, there's some of my friends and people that I work with in the lab are, are starting groups themselves now. It's really amazing, and it's so exciting just to see God in action. Love it. You gotta be in it. You, if you're not in one, find you a grace group, because it's the best thing ever happened to me. And it can happen to you too.